Good day everyone! Like I said in my previous video, today I will show you my first 30 days here in the United States as a new immigrant. And I'll be focusing on the most significant things or important things that happened to me during this time period. In which I'm sure that you guys might go through similar or same process as when your opportunity comes. And I'm sure you'll definitely learn something from my experience. So stay tuned and watch till the end. I'm Nurse Juan De La Cruz, your OFW. In our last video, we arrived at the motel wherein our city was located. Our agency strategically chose this location for us because they knew that our city doesn't have a public transportation. So in order for us to survive, we need those essential things. So in order for us to get by day by day, we selected a place where we can just get everything through walking without the need of transportation. Because FYI, your agent won't be with you throughout the transition period. Mostly they will stay like a week or even less like 3 to 4 days. And everything will be communicated through the cell phone. And even some agencies, they won't even meet you when you arrive here in the United States. They will just arrange some transportation for you to go from the airport going to your next city or apartment. Then it's up to you how to survive during those days. So definitely you have to plan this out. So that's one of the most important things you have to think about even before coming here to the US. Because I've seen new immigrants who came here and went directly to their apartment, not thinking about the essential things. Some of them were the mercy of someone else to help them get those needs, like buy some groceries, bring them around. Unfortunately, not everyone has that option. And also, in order for you to have a car here, uh, you have to have your social security number. Unless you get a car under an international resource wherein you can directly have your car when you arrive here in the United States. Those options are not available for everyone. So you have to think about this as well. The first thing we did is to get a SIM card. Uh, because from this point onward, in order for you to do different transactions, you need to have a contact number. So for us, we chose at and because this is one of the most popular network here in the area. On the plan, we chose to select a prepaid plan. A prepaid plan with a 5 gig internet and unlimited call and text. So I think that will be enough for me and for Mrs each of us. So each one costs around $30. But if you put them together, like under a family plan or under one name, it will be only like $25 each. 5 gig is enough if you have a Wi-Fi at home. But if you don't have a Wi-Fi and you constantly use internet, definitely you need more than 5 gig. So I think you can get like 15 gig will be enough for you. By the way, Prepaid plan here in the United States is not the same as the prepaid plan in the Philippines. Where in the Philippines, like you can just pay like every 10 pesos and to get a load. Like go to a store and get a load. That's not how it works here. Prepaid plan is actually similar to the postpaid plans. Wherein you have to pay first before you can get those services. So meaning you still have to pay those things monthly. So postpaid, you only got to pay them only after you use the services. So those are the two major differences. And on our first day, our agent gave us our relocation fee, which is $1,000. So she gave the $1,000 through a check, wherein we had to go to a bank and create an account for us. So we just gave our address from our motel or hotel and gave us uh, gave them our phone number, uh, wherein we'll be updating them soon once we have our social security number and our new updated place. Then the next day, what we did was apartment hunting. Uh, even before coming to the United States, I have a target apartment in mind. I was able to research them. So I asked my agent to bring me to the specific place, which is like two minutes walk from my hospital, which would be really a good investment for me, right? But it turns out that place is not a good place for me to stay. Uh, what they hear is it has a bad reputation. It has a bad neighborhood. Even though it looks nice and on the internet looks very clean and neat, but there's a notion in the community that this place is known for having a lot of addicts and a lot of maybe some little bit of crimes. So it's not a good place for me to start living. Uh, when we asked our future landlady, she also agreed about it. And it turns out they were right. A few months after, uh, police were have to come into the specific place or area just to settle some of the uh, quarrels uh, in those neighborhoods. And they even offered those policemen to stay in one of the apartments free just so they can have like a peaceful community within the area. So definitely, if you're trying to find an apartment, make sure to get some referrals because through internet, it's not really 100% sure that that's really a good place to stay, even though it looks like it is. But in reality, some things are happening behind those pictures. So make sure to get a referral based on experience from those people who live nearby. 
Then we move on the different parts of the city to find a different apartment. There was one apartment here when it looks really nice. It's like 20 minutes away from my hospital. But it has a laundry shop in between of the apartments around it. So it was nice that having something uh, like a common laundry for you to wash on. Meaning you don't have to buy those laundry machines anymore. Fortunately, the office was closed and no one was picking up. So we decided to move on. And afterwards, after a few minutes, we were able to contact our future landlady. And she offered us two types of house. One house, uh, one bedroom with amenities in it. And she was charging like 650 including the water, electricity, and the Wi-Fi. And the cable. But it was located on top of her house, like uh, just adjacent to her house. So for me and my wife, we were both hesitating because we are a bit noisy and we didn't want to bother our landlady specifically. So the second apartment that they showed us was without anything, without any sofas, without any amenities. So all the bills will be paid by me and nothing included. So, so she was renting that place for $425. But good thing here is it's isolated from other neighbors. There's no residential neighbor below or beside our house. So for me and my wife, that seemed to be a place that's really fit for us. So we chose that apartment. If you're the kind of person who cooks a lot, especially Asians like us, you have to think about them because they hate the smell coming from our cooking. They really do. They couldn't stand it. They're quite sensitive when it comes to smell. In fact, this is the one of the issues that I had staying in this particular apartment, which ended up us trying to find a new apartment. I will explain more in my next video. Uh, if you guys want uh, like an apartment tour and like additional things you need to learn about getting an apartment, please comment down below uh, if you guys are interested. Then at the end of the day, we went to our future hospital that we'll be working in. So what we did is we had a physical examination and also did some blood works. Then for the blood works, it included the Quantiferon TB Gold Blood Test, wherein you don't have to do the TB skin test anymore. Because the TB skin test is known to be like a false positive if you already had a vaccine. So, so here we finally saw the hospital that we'll be working in. For us, it was a bit of a mixed emotion because the hospital was a bit small, not as big as I imagined. So there's a part of me that's anxious, but there's a part of me that's also excited. Then on the next day, what we did is we went for car hunting. So we went to a different city, which is around 45 minutes away from our city, which is known to have multiple different types of auto dealerships. So we went to Honda, we went to Nissan or Toyota, we went to Ford, and other dealerships that has mix of those uh, brands. Then here I realized there are a lot of things more to consider when choosing a car. You have to consider about the features it has, like the cruise control, the safety features, uh, the warranty, the four-wheel drive, and etc. There's a lot of things to figure out. Because like in my mind, I was just thinking that I will just choose a car, like a Honda Civic, and that's it. But little did I know that there's a lot of different cars here in the United States. Like for Honda Civic, there's a different model every year. So you have to consider which of these models you have to choose. And you have to do some research about it. So for me, I was caught in surprise. I didn't imagine that that's how complex and how different choosing a car here in the United States. Adding with some of the technicalities like knowing what APR is, how much APR is, which has something to do with your credit score, and also the length of the contract for your APR. So those other things like really, I really had to research before I had to decide on and really figure out what I really want in a car. That's why I created the video on how to buy a car or how to choose a car. Then on this day, we went to a DMV office or the Department of Motor Vehicles here in the United States, specifically here in Kentucky. DMV is equivalent to LTO or the Land Transportation Office in the Philippines. What we learned here is we really need to have an international driver's license for us to be able to drive here in Kentucky. They won't allow us just to use a regular Philippine license for us to drive here. So that was something I was not prepared. But in my research, they were saying that I don't really have to get an international license. But the DMV is the one who told us you need it. Then since I wasn't convinced, I asked another DMV office which is located nearby in our local city. And they also said the same thing, that I really need to have an international license to be able to drive here in Kentucky. So what I did is I researched online and tried to find the requirements that I need to comply with the international certificate. And asked someone in the Philippines or in Manila specifically to do it for me. I sent all the documents to Manila via email. Good thing there's a scanner here in this hotel wherein I scan all the documents needed for application for that particular license. But here's the thing, our agent is connected to the international auto source wherein they told us 
you don't really have to comply with the international certificate. Your regular license is enough. So for me, I was really confused. I don't know who to believe. But I trust my gut because DMV is really like a law office here wherein I live in. So I follow them instead of the salesperson or agent who's trying to sell me a car. Then what I found out is different states have different type of rules. So it's best to follow whatever the DMV of your local community says about it. Then also what I learned from the DMV is I need to take the written exam as well as a driving test. They said it was a new rule that we have to comply, which is not the information I received from the one who went ahead from us, wherein he only took the test, after which he switched the Philippine license to the US license without, without taking the actual driving test anymore. It's one of the struggle also for me. Because for me, I wasn't confident enough to do the, the actual driving test, specifically for the parallel parking. And also, if you add up all my driving experience, I think the most I did was two months total for my entire lifetime for, for a four-wheel car. So I was definitely a novice when it comes to driving. Then on the next day, we had to pay the deposit for our apartment because a lot of people were asking about it and we need to put a deposit in order to book it for us. Then after signing the papers, we went back to the apartment and take a look at it. When I asked the landlady about the stuff in the garage, he said, the garage is not part of the deal wherein you're paying. So it's not part of the apartment that you're paying. So for me, it's like, I was shocked. Uh, maybe I didn't understand her accent uh, because she has a little bit of Eastern Kentucky accent. But it sucks that the garage is not part of her apartment. So it was a lesson learned for us or maybe a lesson learned for you. Definitely ask the landlady if the garage is part of the apartment. Because here in Kentucky, some of the garages are being used as a storage facility. So sometimes we have to pay extra for it. Then she escorted us to our specific uh, parking spot, which is around like three houses away. In the long run, we realized that it is a form of struggle. Especially if you're like buying groceries and you have to walk three uh, houses away to your house and carrying those uh, groceries from time to time. Especially if you're buying like a water. So it's really a hassle. So that's one of the things you need to think about as well. Or you need to bargain or you could do something about it. Even though we paid for the deposit, the apartment was not yet fully fixed. So we still have to wait for a few days or a week before we can actually move in. And also we're not ready to move in because we don't have a car. And there's no public transportation here in our specific city. So meaning the hotel that where we are staying at the moment is actually a good location for us to stay for the meantime. Because everything we need was within the vicinity or walking distance. Then on July 21, we noted that our laundry is really piling up. So what we did is we asked the motel or the hotel uh, concierge asking them if we can do some laundry anywhere around the vicinity. Then they offered us that they can do the laundry for us. And I said, okay. Then I said, how much? They said, just pay anything you think of, like the cost of it. So for me, I had no idea how much I should pay. I actually paid $5 only for that entire big bag of it. So they did the laundry, they did the uh, dryer and everything. And I only paid $5. So paying $5 is not a good price, really. By right, you should be paying like $20 for it. I'll show you a video of a laundry service here in the United States so you guys could have like an idea of what will happen when you go through a laundry shop and how much you have to pay. So if ever you guys need to have laundry services in your particular hotel, please pay them like $20 or $15 to $20 at least. Then if you're wondering why I'm not mentioning about the social security number, it's because our agent told us to follow up only 10 days after or 10 working days afterwards, so meaning two weeks. So it was a form of waiting game for us, waiting for the social security number. Then on July 23, I received a package from the Philippines through DHL. It includes my international license or certificate, finally. It was that easy to get an international license back home in the Philippines. One of my companions who came here to the US together with me during my flight, who is also under the agency, has decided to take a car under the international auto source. And after signing and doing all the paperwork online, she was instructed to get a car from a specific rental location, uh, which is the nearest one for us, was about around 1 hour and 30 minutes away. So we had to go to Tri-State Airport in order to pick up that specific rental car. Cha only chose a car when she arrived here in the United States because she was worried about uh, how the driving setup will be here in the US and also she was not decided on which car that she will choose from. So if you're planning to choose a car from International Auto Source, you can have it like ready pick up from the time you arrive from a specific airport. Then you will drive the car directly to your house or an apartment 
using that same vehicle. So for us, we had a hard time scheduling a specific pickup time for that particular car because, like I said, there's no public transportation here. And also, we were having trouble uh, from getting someone to bring us from our place to the specific airport or tri-state airport to get the car because our agent is actually leaving three hours away from us. So after the second day, she actually left us. We were just left in our city waiting for our social security number to arrive so we can move on. Fortunately for us, one of the most talented cook and really a hardworking person was available to bring us to the specific area. Ate Ardine committed to do it for us on that particular day. And when we reached there, it, it took Cha less than 10 minutes to fill up and sign the documents needed. Then after which, the sales agent just handed us the key and told us to get the car at the back of the airport. Another good thing about AIS is uh, before you get your actual car, they'll give you a better version car. The car was a Ford Fusion. Uh, it has a hybrid engine wherein it doesn't use as much fuel as a regular car does. So it's like 50%. Then it also has a pre-collision system wherein whenever your car gets too close to another car, your car automatically slows down. So definitely it's a great system to have, especially if you're like me or like Cha, who are both novice when it comes to driving. It was so high tech that me and Cha could not figure out where the transmission is. We couldn't find the regular transmission that wherein you push back and forth. There was none. So it turns out it was a knob type transmission. It was first time for me and Cha to encounter such thing. So good thing Ate Arlene was with us and uh, taught us how to use that thing. Then 14 days after arriving here in the United States, we went to the Social Security Administration office to follow up about our status. Unfortunately, they told us it is still not ready. It may be on transition because it's not reflecting on their system. Then they asked us to follow up after one week. Then on this day, our apartment was ready. So me, Cha, and my wife decided we're ready to move out now of the hotel. So when we move in, we had to do a lot of things. The first thing we have to do is to call the electricity company to call them so the name or the account for that particular apartment will be under my name now. I only have to do it through calling through the phone and giving them the details that I need. Before calling the electrical company, you have to ask the landlady for the meter number, the specific meter number for your particular unit. The next is I have to do the same thing with the water. Unfortunately, for the water, you have to go to the office directly to have it changed to your name. So I have to travel like 10 minutes via car in order to get there and I also had to pay like a deposit. I think I paid the deposit like $200. You also need to ask the landlady for the particular meter number. Then for the bed and other cabinets, fortunately my landlady was selling some of the items that the previous tenant left behind. So she sold it to us like a really cheap. $80 for the bed, for the cabinet setup and the nightstands. So it, it was a really a good price. So if you guys plan to buy things that are quite bulky, try to get it online because delivery will be definitely an issue for you. Like if you don't have like a pickup truck and you don't want to pay anything for the delivery, it's best to get everything online. Then for the other stuff, we decided to get it during Thanksgiving because during Thanksgiving, they have crazy sales over here in the United States. They call it the Black Friday sale and the Cyber Monday sale. They really have good prices. You just have to queue properly and to take note of particular places where they have like those really good sales. So after browsing cars from different dealerships and online, I finally decided to get one. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to buy the car yet because I don't have the social security number. And I gave them the bank's agent contact number or email address in order for the dealership to send the paperwork uh, for the car to our agent. Wherein, the agent will now be the one doing the computation and will give us a final APR and if ever we're allowed to get that particular loan for that particular vehicle. But like with the dealership, the agent told us that we have to get our social security number first. And the next day, she approved the loan for a car, but like a temporary only because we don't have the social security number and she gave us the APR. She also instructed us to find an insurance for the car in order for her to complete all the documents aside from the social security number. So on this day, we did a car insurance hunting. We tried to do everything first online. We tried Geico, we tried Root, we tried State Farm, um, we tried Progressive, but all of them were really giving expensive rates, like really expensive, like $400 more. By right, you only have to pay like less than $200 per month. And the main reason for that is because we didn't have a US license yet. We're only using a foreign license. 
So because of that, the rate is really like triple or double. So me and Cha were not convinced. We tried some of the local car insurance companies within our area. Unfortunately, they were also saying the same thing. The prices that were giving us were also similar, like $400 and above. So we really had no choice. So the cheapest one for my particular car was through Geico. By the way, in order for you guys to be able to find or canvas a proper insurance, you need to get the car's V number or the vehicle number. V number is different from the plate number. So these are the things that most of the car insurance needs in order for them to proceed, in order to get a quotation or computation for your car insurance. Tips for the car insurance. Get the car insurance, but ask them to book the start date few days or a week afterwards. Since the bank is still processing the paperwork for the loan, the bank only needs the policy number for the car insurance. It doesn't require you to have it activated immediately. Because if not, they will start billing you for the car insurance from the day you call them. Even though the car is still not in your possession or is still at the auto dealership company. Then when you're about to pick up the car from the car dealership, that's the time you can call the car insurance company. It will take like 5 minutes phone call to tell them to please activate your car insurance starting now. It's that easy. Then on this day, finally, my social security number arrived. The social security number is actually just a small piece of paper. And it has a particular numbers on it. This number, you have to keep it confidential. Because here in the US, identity theft is really a thing. So be careful. Then FYI, social security number is different from the green card. The green card will come later on. When I received our social security number, I updated our bank officer immediately. Then afterwards, she was able to process the documents needed. So after she did all the paperwork, she asked us to proceed to the local community bank for us to sign the papers. So after we signed the bank documents for the loan, my car agent was kind enough to help us to bring us from our apartment to the dealership to sign the documents and finally to get a car. So when we arrived at the dealership, they asked us to sign some documents. Then they offered some of insurances, particularly for particular parts of that car, which we declined. Then after a few minutes, they gave us the key to the car. During this day, I was really nervous. I was really scared because it's the first time for me to drive an automatic car, like really first time. Then after I started the car, I shifted the gear to drive. Then when I released the brake, the car suddenly started moving. Then I pressed the brake again. I said, I think there's something wrong with the car. Then when I released the brake again, the car started moving. So I was thinking there was something wrong with the car. I was thinking the car might be broken. I even did a one round back to the agent and I told him, I think there's something wrong with the car. <laughs> so the agent told me that's really how automatic cars work. So it was kind of embarrassing for us. <laughs> First time, then we went home safely. And of course, I drive so slow. And a lot of people were honking behind me because I was causing some traffic and some delays. But of course, I didn't care. As long as I'm safe, my car is safe, my wife is safe. So I really didn't care whatever they're doing behind me. Since I already have my social security number, my license can now be transferred. After it arrived, it only took the following day for me to have my Kentucky license because everything was fixed by my agency even before the social security number arrived. So you can do that as well. And the license here in the US, it doesn't come like back in the Philippines where it's supposed to be a card. Here, they will only send you an email. Then you can just print it. You don't actually have to bring it with you because the license can be viewed online. It is open for the public. So since we already have a social security number, the paperwork, the medical, and everything in the hospital was already cleared. And they decided to have us to start on August 16 as our first day. They couldn't start earlier because the training officers were not available then. That's why there was one week more delay before we could start working. So one month after August 16 was the first day of my work here in the United States. There are a lot more significant things that happened after the next following weeks. Like what happened to my car insurance, my driver's license, my first US salary, the health insurance offered by my agency, and a lot more things. In which I'll gladly share to you on my next video. So please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more informative videos. Again, my name is Nurse Juan de la Cruz, your OFW nurse. Thank you for watching. God bless. See you.